My name is uh, Erik Pekel and I'm uh, delighted to guide you through today's uh, program. With me are Patricia Vermeulen, the CEO of Amref uh, Flying Doctors, the Dutch branch of uh, Amref Health Africa, and Bianca Nijhoff, the Managing Director of the Netherlands uh, Water Partnership. And we have a video uh, connection with uh, Will Sarney from Water Foundry, live from Denver, Colorado, USA. And with Joseph Muraboula, the CEO of uh, Kifwa, the Kenya Innovative Finance Facility for Water, live from Nairobi, Kenya. Welcome, great uh, to have you uh, in the show. And uh, we are live, so feel free to send in any questions or thoughts on your mind uh, using uh, the chat so that we will feel this sense of uh, connection uh, online. And uh, also the, the questions that you uh, send in, I may ask them here to our uh, experts uh, in the studio and uh, at the distance. So let's uh, have a look at the uh, agenda. Uh, we'll talk about how uh, COVID-19 affects uh, the worldwide water sector. Can we put water at the center of the plans for economic recovery? Uh, we'll talk about the importance of uh, water for food about collaboration across stakeholders and about the opportunities from uh, digitalization. So without further ado, uh, let's get uh, started. Um, Bianca, as a director of the Netherlands uh, Water Partnership, you hear from all these uh, players in the water uh, sector. Uh, we'll talk about uh, how they experience uh, COVID-19. Uh, mm -hmm. But first of all, how do you personally uh, experience uh, this situation? Well, for me, it means working from home, being restricted. And in that sense, also, I feel, feel a little bit less connected to the members of NWP in the fact that I can't visit them. We don't join them in sessions globally. Um, so, yeah, in that sense, I, I feel it. But for me, it also uh, indicates, again, a sense of urgency for, for water. For me, water is, was already connected to the changes in, in the climate. And now I also see that for people to, to be safe from COVID, we need to, them to be able to wash their hands. So there's another reason for me to be very passionate about my work. Um, because we need clean water to be able to safeguard ourselves from COVID. So again, water top of the agenda, and that's what I'm passionate about to walk, work on. So extra push for me to uh, to position myself and to really work on that. So this current situation actually shows the demand, the need for clean uh, water access uh, to water for uh, hygiene uh, and also for uh, for clean food, of course, uh, that is safe. Uh, for safe food. So this is my question for you. Do you believe that you could put water more at the center of uh, the plans for economic uh, recovery? Might water actually uh, uh, benefit or might COVID-19 uh, actually speed up some initiatives like drinking water, hygiene uh, and uh, sanitation? Please choose the answer uh, by clicking on it and uh, we'll see what you uh, think. We see uh, currently that 100% agrees, but there's now some uh, minor changes, but all towards the really positive. Please uh, make your uh, choice. So, uh, Joseph from uh, Kifwa, the Kenya Innovative Finance Facility for uh, Water. Uh, you are a co-developer of water initiatives uh, in Kenya. Um, how do you uh, relate to this uh, uh, personally? How do you deal with the current situation and how do you feel about speeding up uh, initiatives uh, through COVID-19? Thank you, Rick. Um, the, the situation with COVID this can has, has meant that we have to, we have to, to make a lot of adjustments in, in, um, in the way we do, uh, we do things. Uh, first of all, um, the government advised uh, that we need to, to ensure physical distancing. What that meant is that most of my colleagues now work from home, so I don't see my colleagues um, as often as, as I used to do. Uh, most meetings with collaborators, with partners, with funders uh, have moved online. And so uh, we are seeing quite a lot of a trend uh, in terms of um, ensuring fit, uh, social distancing. Um, but from a wider um, uh, sectoral perspective, we see quite a few uh, positives. Well, well, one, there is there's a lot more focus on, the, on, on on water, especially among the the top uh, officials in the Kenya government. 
Um, uh, immediately, uh, we, found, we found our our first case of COVID on the 13th of March. The government gave a directive that nobody should be uh, should be uh, cut off from what even if they haven't paid their bills. What what the message that gave is that the, the government is trying to ensure that everybody has access to water. Uh, the Nairobi Metropolitan Service, which is the um, the organisation that runs the city of Nairobi now, um, has had to to uh, to make about a hundred water boreholes around informal settlements, so that everybody within the informal uh, settlements can have access to water. And previously, the situation was that because of dilapidated infrastructure, infrastructure to the informal settlements have been destroyed. So a lot of people within uh, those settlements had to walk very long distances to get access to, to get water. But now, because of COVID, uh, what has been brought closer to them through the construction of borders. And, and that is quite a, a, positive, a positive for us. Um, the other thing is that in the initial days, um, because of lockdowns and the need to ensure that uh, uh, movement is restricted, we, we had a few challenges with our work. We could not send our consultants to the field. Um, yeah, but eventually things have opened up. Now we've got government officials get uh, authorization for consultants to move and that for work moves on. So if, if I may say, yeah, personally, initially difficult adjustments, but slowly by slowly we are getting used to uh, the, new, the new normal, as they call it. Yeah, so currently there is some uh, momentum, some initiatives you see are sped up. And they feel the urgency uh, politically as well. Still, uh, there's also some uh, uh, participants who disagree to uh, say, well, I disagree. Uh, and possibly this is to do with the uh, enormous amount of money that is needed to, to recover. And then, you know, that needs to find its way. And it needs to find its way to ev a lot more uh, pressing uh, issues. Um, so we'll talk about that uh, in a bit, uh, a, a bit more in a little bit. Uh, first of all, uh, Patricia, uh, Amref Health Africa teams up with the African uh, communities to create lasting change. Uh, but first of all, how do you personally uh, experience uh, this current situation? Um, personally, I have the challenges like everybody else, working from home, feeling a bit disconnected to the teams, um, especially the teams in Africa, of course. Um, have not having traveled this year and not traveling the rest of the year and maybe in 2021. So that's hampering and it feels poor, you know, like uh, we, we, we're used to work different. Um, personally, I'm also very concerned about the situation in Africa. Um, what we see is uh, cases, COVID cases going up, um, but we know that there's no testing capacity, so we don't know the factual picture. We see um, case for fatality is not very high, but we also know that deaths are not reported always. So there's a lot we don't know about the situation, which is very worrisome. At the same time, we know that schools are closed, girls are, are not going to school. Uh, there's lots of uh, problems related to that. And like in the Netherlands, um, all the essential health services, the regular services, are not being accessed because of fear of going to hospitals, lack of healthcare workers. Uh, to just help people who are ill with other diseases than COVID-19. So there's actually a lot to worry about. Um, but looking at, um, at WASH and the water sector in particular, I do think there's a huge momentum now because there's a, a clear need to, to really invest in making sure everybody has access to clean water and to good and healthy sanitation. So. Um, I'd like to see it from the positive side, uh, how we can make use of that, uh, that current political will, uh, the, the, the support of the private sector, and collaborate to, uh, to go reach the SDGs, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a picture currently on the screen of a class that is a thought on uh, good hygiene and uh, sanitation. Yeah. Can you tell a little bit of what's happening in the field? Yes, so we have we work with uh, with structures that are in place. So there's in, uh, for example, Ethiopia and Kenya, there are community health workers, and they engage with the communities on on daily basis, and they monitor the situation of the people in the villages. Um, they educate people on how to stay healthy with the limited resources they have, and what to do when they're not healthy. So what you see in the picture is actually awareness raising. 
among women in the village through a community health worker that is being trained by AMREF. But they're not employed by AMREF, they're many times employed by the government or chosen by the communities to do this on a voluntary basis. Um, yeah, so they play a crucial role um, and we educate and we can talk later maybe about how we educate the community health workers because to do that on a large scale, to reach thousands of people, especially in times of COVID, that's not easy. Yeah, there's an urgent need on a really big scale on actually quite simple uh, things like uh, washing hands, uh, teaching class on the importance of that, handing out mouth masks. You can make exactly. a really big difference, but it's very difficult to organize. So we'll talk about that in a bit. Yeah, and maybe last thing, because if you look at that picture, you can see already the context is different. And if you imagine being in a, a slum area in, in Nairobi, uh, where there's no access to clean water, people live very, very on top of each other. There's no way of social distancing. There's no way of self-isolation. All of that you need to take into account when you design your strategies and try to implement uh, that well. Yeah. yeah, so we'll talk uh, about that a bit more uh, later during uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, Will, you help uh, corporations with their water uh, strategies. How do you personally uh, experience this period? So a number of things. Uh, the way I like to think about this, and it's based on observations from uh, U.S. and non-U.S. multinationals that have water stewardship programs and also uh, the innovation side and investing side is that uh, the pandemic has really been a trend accelerator. I, I believe we've heard that previously. Uh, so the digital transformation of the water sector was well underway in January of this year. What we've seen is that it's been absolutely accelerated. Analog is really not an option in for both uh, water wastewater utilities and also the industrial sector. So the ability to uh, quantify water use, uh, determine water quality and manage assets uh, and support uh, remote workforces has become uh, absolutely critical uh, for the water sector. Also an increased focus on the social dimensions of water in water stewardship programs. You know, historically, uh, water stewardship has really been primarily focused on environmental impact uh, and, and certainly social, but we've seen really more and more corporate water stewardship programs really understand that access to safe drinking water, sanitation, and hygiene is critical for the communities in which they operate in, their workforce, and society at large, and just an, an overall interest in what's going on in the world of water and what needs to change you know, changing business as usual. And it's really coming from, uh, based on what we've seen over the six or seven months, companies that have not been engaged in the water sector. So oil and gas companies, clean tech companies, looking at the water sector and, and really thinking about whether there's a business opportunity here. If so, uh, how do they leverage their skills, capabilities, footprint to solve water scarcity and water quality problems? And then finally, uh, you know, a lot more interest, in my view, from investors, whether it's angel investors, uh, VCs, family offices, private equity funds, looking at the water sector and acknowledging uh, really that you can't do anything without water. It is critical for economic development, business growth, uh, ecosystem health and social well-being, which is what we've been talking about so far. So as much as the pandemic has been uh, brutal uh, in many ways, it, it really has drawn attention to water as, uh, you know, I like to say the glue in humanity. We, we can't do anything without it, and it's essential. So how do we do it better? And when you talk about uh, commercial and uh, sustainable water technology solutions, uh, Will, it's not only a pandemic happening, it's also a fierce economic uh, crisis. Uh, so. How, what is your uh, outlook on that? Uh, in, in terms of uh, what are the opp uh, technology opportunities and yeah, and also impact. given given the fact that at the one hand uh, the urgency is seen and felt uh, uh, a lot more, but at the same time 
it seems that there is a, a big fight over uh, budgets uh, currently that are uh, declining. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, obviously, uh, lack of access to safe drinking water, uh, you know, Washbury Broadway is uh, not necessarily getting any better, but, uh, you know, we are seeing more attention focused on that, and I believe it's an opportunity to, you know, as they say, rebuild better, reboot, you know, what's the new normal going forward, uh, and, you know, technology innovation is certainly part of that, digital being one of it, also, uh, moving away from centralized systems, which, you know, historically have done fairly well, but moving towards decentralized distributed systems to deliver uh, safe drinking water. Yeah, so about the current uh, situation, we also uh, asked uh, two young experts uh, from the EPP uh, program and they reflect how they reflect on the uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. Let's have a look at the short video. Hello, my name is Daniela Gomez Martinez. I am biologist. I'm from Colombia and currently I'm working in Aqua Valle, a company that provides the service of water and beverage for several municipalities and one of the water operator partnership of Waterworks. In Colombia, as in other countries, the pandemic has changed many daily habits and introduced others to reduce the risk. But beyond that, our daily life and work had to adapt to keep providing the service while we are keeping us safe. We have innovated with the creation of an app that would allow the users to make payments, to realize complaints and reclaims, and also they can give us information about the illegal connections and keep updated about the state of the service. Hello everyone, my name is Pipi Jo from Myanmar. I'm currently working on the Manly Waterworks project, uh, which is one of the water operator partnership from the Waterworks program. Well, similar to most of the country, Myanmar also hit by the COVID-19 since March. One of the most important things during the pandemic is access to clean water. Well, even before the pandemic, we have been dealing with high non-revenue water and intermittent water supply. So people have to mainly rely on their private wells. Uh, during this pandemic, we have quite a lot of challenges uh, because of high demand and expectation from our customer to supply more water. So uh, we move on uh, to uh, to the next phase, which is all about economic uh, recovery that you see is uh, starting already with uh, very big uh, plans from uh, governments, uh, from policy uh, makers. Uh, but it's also about, uh, I think from the perspective of the water sector, about how can you put water at the center of those uh, plans for uh, recovery and take the importance of water for food, for example. Uh, Bianca, how do you feel about this? Do you think mm -hmm. that the importance of, of uh, water, the, the value is taken into account generally? Mm -hmm. Well, we just heard actually from the YEP program, the youngsters, so the young expert professionals educated in a program the Netherlands Water Partnership uh, runs, um, how important it is. And they are the future generation, so I think they, they, they know what they want for the future. And yes, um, I, 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 I indeed don't think that water, that we under, understand the importance of water, that we understand the value of water yet, yet well enough. Although we, we should actually, with South Africa, Cape Town, um, running out of water here in the Netherlands, we, we, we are close to running out of water, which you wouldn't say from a country where, where there's actually a lot of water available. We've become very good at getting water out of the country instead of maintaining it, which is, is the time of where we are in uh, right now. But looking at how it is globally, I think in, uh, I think we'll mention it already, sustainable development goals, the SDGs, which is the global agenda for the world to work on. And, and water is actually, it's one of the SDGs, which is related to WASH. Um, but it's connected to many of the other SDGs, which you already uh, also said, Eric. Um, so it is everywhere. And maybe that's the, um, the bad luck for water, that it is everywhere and it's not at one point like we have with COVID now. It is in those agendas. It is part, uh, it's recognized as being very important, as, as Will said, increasingly important. Um, but without putting a monetary value on it, it looks like we tend to forget it. And I don't, I'm not stressing now that we should put a monetary value on it, but I think that 
the SDGs already is a good start of to think of the values in this world differently. We have a monetary value, economic, we have a social value, and we have an environmental value. And we need all those to be in balance to have this world where the future generation, the young experts actually also can, can, can live healthy. So we are starting to, you see it popping up, um, but in my, I believe we can even put it higher on the agenda. So it should be in the, 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 the green recovery programs, put water front and center there. In the Netherlands, we have this growth funds, which recently was released by the government, uh, releasing a lot of money into society to, to um, build a sustainable future. Put the criteria, put water in there. I think that would be very, very important for us to keep on, or well, actually start living within the boundaries we have on this planet. And maybe last but not least, um, I think when looking at how to deal with water as, as an issue in all the different, we, we find it back in, in, in struggling with cities keeping, uh, keeping them, them safe from, from flooding or providing them with drinking water. We see it in food, we see it in energy, we see it in health, we see it in gender. It actually touches upon everything. Um, so an integrated, integrated solutions are key here, collaborating cross-sectoral and collaborating with all stakeholders. And so you're quite uh, positive about the, uh, the current status, but you see room for some improvement, especially mm -hmm. for some more initiative from the players in the water sector to reach out a bit more and make it more vivid, perhaps. Uh, yeah, I'm quite positive. Maybe that's a bit too positive. Ah. I, I'm, I'm actually disappointed that we don't see it um, strongly. I don't think we see it strong enough in all the agendas and all the recovery programs. Um, well, let's see what the audience yeah. thinks. I'd, I'd like uh, to introduce the next poll, which is exactly about this uh, topic. So do you think uh, that the value of water is really seen? Just to make your, uh, your choice. So the position is decision makers in government, finance and business continue to misunderstand the value of water. So if you're negative, then you strongly agree. So there's, <laughs> it's, it's a difficult uh, position actually to read. It should have been the other way around. So decision makers in government, finance and business continue to misunderstand the value of water and 21% strongly agrees, 59% agrees. So there's absolutely room for improve, um, improvement and especially if, yeah. if, if there's some collective action, collaboration within yeah. uh, the sector, but also reaching out. So we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. But for, first of all, Patricia, um, we wanted to illustrate this with an example, right? And water for food is, is a very strong example, I think. And when, when it comes to water for food, do you feel that the current crisis will help to speed up the, the change that we feel is so, so necessary? Um, I definitely say yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, because water, water is the basis for everything we know um, and we see lots of opportunities. So I, 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 cho I choose to stick to the positive side, the hope side, uh, but also to demand um, that uh, the government and, and actually every actor takes responsibility to ensuring that this is actually going to happen. But we see innovations that we can scale um, and we see lots of support for the short term but need to make actually really ensure that there's support for the long term. Yeah, so um, I think it's great how, how we see partnerships arising now uh, between uh, corporate sector and NGOs and others to to really um, work together, but for the long term you need to go way beyond. So I think uh, that will be something I would like to talk about also, how, how we're going to make the short term initiative sustainable in the long term, because I think that requires a very different uh, strategy and solution and partnerships. Mm -hmm. uh, a question was uh, sent in uh, towards you, uh, Will. Uh, Tim uh, uh, would like to ask you uh, what wash areas or water areas do you see as uh, profitable investments that could create jobs? Oh, sure. Um, you know, I think there's a, a significant opportunity to really rethink infrastructure. So green infrastructure, uh, localized, which is, you know, distributed, decentralized and, and off-grid technologies. Uh, you know, for me, those are the big trends. And it, there's also an interesting uh, trend going on, uh, which has been going on for quite some time, but accelerated again, as I mentioned previously, around alternative hydration. 
which is you know moving hydration out of uh, more traditional delivery mechanisms, which is you know the tap, bottled water, water fountains, and you know bottled water companies looking at both in-home, out-home, outside the home uh, hydration systems, uh, in-home treatment systems, things like that. So uh, again, you know. Scarcity and poor water quality and concerns around safety uh, are driving innovation and, and there's some really interesting investments out there and uh, startups in the world that uh, will have a positive economic impact and also uh, help us uh, hopefully achieve SDG 6. So we're talking about putting water at the heart of uh, the plans for economic uh, recovery. Uh, Joseph, what opportunity do you see when you talk about influence and reaching out from the sector to open up uh, the eyes of the public and uh, policymakers? Yeah, and, and, and this probably builds on the um, on, on the valuation for water that that Bianca was talking about. Yeah, one of the things we basically seen and accelerated by this uh, COVID is, is the fact that people are beginning to see the real value of, of water, which means, I mean, which basically is that water is probably your first line of defense when, when it comes to uh, disease uh, prevention. And so everybody is sort of uh, working around to see how they can use the, the water in the systems more, uh, more, a lot more efficiently. So, but to come to your um, uh, question about uh, basically collaboration between the water sector and, and the rest of the ecosystem, we basically see a lot of opportunity to package water into commercial uh, agriculture, for instance, through use of, of, of irrigation. We, we already have a project that is basically doing that. And the, imp the, the impact of that, of course, is to, uh, uh, to is on food security, basically provide uh, Use more food, using less, uh, using less land, and making sure that the, the vagaries of weather do not necessarily dictate when and how much food uh, you can put, uh, you can produce. And then we also see a lot of opportunity in terms of um, using water to produce clean energy and therefore reduce um, reduce carbon emissions. And also because uh, what we find is that um, uh, clean energy tends to be a lot cheaper than, than uh, the dirty energy, if you like, on the edge of oil energy. So we see a lot of uh, cost savings and reducing costs within the economic system, be it for manufacturing uh, and other things, just by using uh, water to produce the clean energy uh, through uh, hydropower. There's also a lot of uh, opportunities for um, reducing travel time um, uh, as a way uh, by using water to reduce travel time. Uh, for instance, we see that um, it takes, for instance, um, about nine hours to travel from one end of the coast of Kenya to the other end, and, and because that it, it requires you to use the road network. If you are to put up a water transport system, say a commercial ferry, that time will probably be reduced uh, by about by about 70 percent. So we reduce it probably from from nine hours to probably about three hours. So what you basically therefore see that water is an enabler of economic activity. It's the center of uh, of economic growth, and also integration. You know, just uh, ensuring that people communicate a lot faster and be able to reach certain places a lot a lot a lot faster. Thank you very much for sharing those uh, examples. Uh, Patricia, also a great example, I think, when it's about putting water at the heart of economic recovery. It's really basic eh, in the WASH programs, uh, making sure that people have access to uh, proper uh, toilets, uh, sanitation. Uh, can you tell a bit about this uh, project that we see on the screen uh, currently? How is it organized? Yeah, this is one of my favorite photos and one of my favorite programs, uh, maybe. It's uh, a beautiful picture. Yeah, it is very powerful, you know, Absolutely. from the people. And she's actually very proud, this, this woman, who has decided to uh, build her own toilet. And that sounds very simple, 
Um, but access to sanitation is not a given worldwide, absolutely not. And it's not easy to build a toilet which is really safe. You know, if you have to also uh, think about waste management, how, how do you going to take care of the, the human waste? What can you actually do with the human waste? Um, and how to build safely, you have to have good technical designs. Um, but this lady, even if she has the design, she doesn't necessarily have access to the materials to build it. And it involves quite some materials. So in this particular program, we've um, collaborated with uh, the, the community itself, um, but also with local banks to see whether for all the families, whether they are poor or really poor, um, there could be some kind of a loan that they could access to really be able to build this toilet. And um, it's, it's very innovative because, yeah, giving a loan to the very poor might be very risky. But local banks have actually experienced that it's a good thing. So at this moment, this is a photo uh, from, from Kenya, from one of the, the districts, um, that the people who take the loan, they build their toilet and they repay the whole loan within the 12 months that they are being given. So it's a very good opportunity also for the local banks and the whole in, uh, industry. An additional thing that you see happening is she needs materials to construct that the young people in the village say, hey, let, let us do some construction. You know, we can actually together buy a machine, we'll, we'll make bricks and we'll have, uh, you know, we'll, anything. You're, so you see businesses arise and the young people really saying and standing up, we can take a role in our own local economy. Um, and in this uh, district, actually everyone has a toilet um, and you can see health indicators improving, uh, cholera going down, you know, so that, that's very impressive. So the local government is very supportive. Um, the people are, actually, of course, very happy. And what you also see happening is you can have a simple toilet construction, but there's something that we call the sanitation ladder. You can grow on that ladder. So uh, you want the next best thing, and then you want the next best thing. And people take care of each other. So if you can't get the loan because it's, it's too expensive anyway, you team together. And we'll say first for you to have a toilet, then for me, uh, that very much belongs to the social structures that are in place. So, um, and we know that having a toilet is uh, is very important in hygienic behavior. Uh, this household also needs um, access to clean water to be able to wash hands um, and to be able to just provide for a safe environment for, for the family. So it goes hand in hand. It's never only a hygiene project, never only a water project. It's integrated. Um, and actually, yeah, integrated with lots of other things. Yeah, it's very effective and uh, it works very, very well. Yeah. Uh, Bianca, a question was sent in by uh, Jeroen from Arcadis. Yeah. And he says, I don't think a lack of available water is underestimated, but more fundamental is who or what mechanism will take care of coordination and market regulation. Uh, so it's uh, the chicken and the egg, I think. Uh, who, who is the director of the positive yeah. change? Yeah. What will be your uh, outtake on that? I can I can see him saying that. I think it depends a bit also on where you are on, on this on this planet. Actually, sure. some regions there is simple lack of water, others there's access. But it is indeed the the availability of it and how we how we distribute uh, water. So once it is available. Um, who is taking the lead in distributing this? And in the Netherlands, we have that perfectly organized. But as Joseph can probably tell us a lot more about in, in Kenya, there's the different systems. Um, who, a lot of times we also believe that it's a given that we have water available. It's organized through government. I'm the opinion that um, also having worked in, in, in business for a while as well, and you see businesses taking their responsibility as well, for example, on this plant. And I know from one example in India where there was this plant and they had taken care of for themselves to have enough water, also in times when there wouldn't be enough water, when there would be droughts. Um, but the government in the end uh, asked the business to use that water also for the communities living around that factory, which in that 
in the end, the, the factory was shut down, which is obviously a lot of damage to the business. But at the same time, a lot of the employees of the business were living around the factory. So there's a responsibility felt by businesses and picked up by businesses, which I'm very positive about as well. So I, I, I think the way who's responsible for everybody having water, what are we willing to pay, pay for it, and what systems are we willing to set up in collaboration? Because this is not something we can, we can solve, only the governments can solve. It has to be done by the society which includes businesses and governments. I think this is an issue we should should solve together. And finance, obviously, and, and again, Joseph can share some more examples on that, I believe. Yeah. Finance plays a crucial role in here in unlocking a lot of the money which is available, but how can you unlock it to really safeguard water and everybody has water around the globe? Yeah. So, uh, uh, Will, I'd like to direct this question to you as well, because... Uh, yeah, I, th I think this is what you call the wicked problem, right? A big complexity and who takes the initiative and who calls the, the shots and who is the director of it uh, all. Can you say something about this? Sure. Um, so, uh, wicked problems. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily mean they're evil unless you don't have access to watch than they are. Uh, but wicked problems are complex problems and water is a wicked problem and one of the definitions one of the attributes of a wicked problem is that no one stakeholder can solve a wicked problem and you really need to engage in you know the term of art of water sector is collective action uh, I like to think about it as aligned action not just getting people together but actually aligning on what needs to be solved and I believe you have the image up and uh, you know the way to think about this uh, in my mind and, and others is we need to do a better job within the water sector and we need to bring in outsiders and uh, we've, we've got the ability to do that now uh, and uh, bringing in folks that really know nothing about water <clears throat> and bring different talents and capabilities experiences is, is absolutely imperative and uh, if you look at the, the image, uh, it expands the view of who we need to bring in to solve water as a wicked problem. So think about entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs have absolutely no scale, but they have speed and focus and passion. So give them something to solve, and more often than not, they get it done. On the other end of the scale, you have the public sector they have great scale, but they don't move fast. Everyone is in the middle, uh, depending on who they are and business culture and, and mindset and so on. They could either be more towards the entrepreneurs or more towards the public sector. But, you know, that's where you see multinationals that uh, innovate well. They have speed. They have scale. Uh, Non-governmental organizations, NGOs, again, are sort of somewhere in the middle. And then you have uh, academics, uh, you know, technology transfer offices, investors, and, and so on. So thinking about casting a wider net on who we bring in to solve water is a wicked problem, I believe is the great opportunity right now. And you're starting to see initiatives that actually do that, as opposed to us talking amongst ourselves drawing on the same toolbox, same problems, same narrative. And I, I think one of the things the pandemic has done is essentially make a lot more people in general accessible via video and the ability to bring people in and engage on solving a problem um, has scaled. I don't have to go to a conference anymore. I miss them but I don't have to go. I can dial somebody up and I know they're sitting at home. Yeah, and this is uh, yeah. the, the promise of digitalization. You're talking about bringing in uh, all different kinds of uh, people to uh, broaden the uh, outreach and also come up with new perspective, new types of uh, solutions. And a question that relates to that uh, from uh, Ruth, and I think it's uh, nice uh, for you to answer, uh, Joseph. But he's wondering, is private financing of uh, drinking water in uh, Kenya really such a good idea? What, what do you think? Yeah, uh, uh, thanks, thanks for that question. Um, 
But, but before I come to that question, I wanted to make a little contribution to the to the previous discussion. About yeah, yeah, great. Go ahead. About the, um, yes, uh, just, just about trying to solve the problem of, of water. What we generally find, and what I normally see in the, in the Kenyan water sector, is, is quite a lot of fragmentation. There's pretty little coordination, and it's not easy to tell who's doing uh, what where. Everybody sort of just comes up with their own uh, initiatives and, um, and and drives it, and, and that quite a lot of that has to do with the fact that um, we don't really have accurate data in terms of even water availability itself and the heights distributed across the many basins, the, the six basins that we have uh, in Kenya, and so the, the, we will solve that problem perhaps when we we. We, we, we get better management of, of water data. So water data management systems uh, uh, to inform water allocation plans across uh, the various subsectors, various countries probably is what will be uh, will, will, will help uh, solve this kind of uh, kind of problem. But to come to your question about whether use of private finance for water is, is, is a good idea. Um, in other words, whether there's, there's a return or not, I think it is um, it's a very good idea. I mean, in my three years experience working uh, for KIFA, I actually see that there's quite a lot of, um, of, of, of money uh, to be made within the water sector if you know how to position yourself and look for the right opportunities and, and, and probably look for the right uh, way of blending uh, 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 money. You know, a lot of times that question arises because of historical reasons. The, um, the water sector, uh, at least in Kenya, has been uh, pre predominantly funded by the, by the public sector, by public money, which is looking for social return rather than an economic return. And so every time um, the private sector people look at it, because there's no president, there's nobody else who's gone ahead and, and done a profitable project, then it appears as if, um, as if there's probably no money to be made. But I, I have in mind quite a lot of enterprises that are actually making uh, uh, money, the centralized water uh, systems, I mean, basically, distribution of water through zones, through hubs, through water kiosks. Yes, they are making a decent return out of it. Um, I have also in mind people who are making um, a lot a, a lot of, of, of money within the sector through water infrastructure, uh, pipe manufacturers, uh, borehole drillers, and that sort of thing. They actually make it quite a bit, quite, quite a decent return um, out of it. Um, of course, the, um, the water bowels of people, which we are trying to, you know, to reduce, are also making quite a decent, uh, a decent return. So it is all about um, how you position yourself and uh, within within the sector, and 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 like every sector where the public, the the, the governments are scaling down the involvement and the private sector is increasing its involvement. It's more or less how you work with your partners and how you work with your customers. Yeah, but the overall answer is that there's, there's decent money to be made within the water sector. Thank you very much, uh, Joseph. Uh, so let's uh, now take uh, a short moment to watch uh, the next uh, video. It's a short uh, video with our uh, young experts who tell what they see happen uh, currently in their uh, water sector, in their projects uh, around them. Let's have a look at the video. Um, because of the lockdown, our municipality received less income, resulting to an extra challenge to supply more water to our customer. The most prominent, prominent factor which revealed by this pandemic is our poor water governance systems. Due to COVID-19, people are more aware of the importance of water sanitation and hygiene. As a conclusion, I think um, with the continuous support from the program like Waterworks and the assistance from the government of the Netherlands and the Netherlands Water Partnership, I believe that there is a tremendous potential for Myanmar water sector to grow. Finally, I hope that there will be more co cooperation between uh, Myanmar and Dutch water sector in the future. Thank you very much.
Of course, that with the pandemic situations, we have found challenges. And one of them is the financial sustenance of the company. Because in short term, we have to guarantee the vital minimum to the vulnerable users. And in long term, we have to compliance with the program invest to guarantee the continuity and quality of the water service. Adding to the above, the government ordered to reconnect all the water users that had the service suspended because in this emergency, we have to prioritize the hygiene, which have caused that the company's income decrease because some users are not paying. About the opportunities to deal with the current situation, I think that as a start, the COVID-19 pandemic has made more evident, public and urgent the need of improved the water supply and sanitation, especially for the vulnerable population. This is pushing the government to show results and to invest, which is in itself an opportunity because it can create the need to generate more specific politics to aid with this situation. I think that an example of a water solution could be the construction of regional community aqueducts that would allow the people to have access to good quality water. Thank you for letting me share this. So uh, there, there's a lot of uh, momentum currently, but there's also uh, quite a few uh, big uh, issues, especially when it comes to uh, funding. Uh, Patricia, when we talk about the collective uh, effort towards uh, putting water at the center of uh, plans for economic uh, recovery, uh, it's all about uh, language, about reaching out, about uh, influence, uh, about uh, working uh, uh, together, sharing the right uh, type of uh, stories. But your organization is primarily focused on health. So can you give us an idea how, how water is uh, discussed as a part of that? What is your, how do you uh, perceive the value of uh, water? How is it seen uh, throughout the organization? Well, as extremely valuable. Mm -hmm. um, actually, that can be illustrated with very simple examples. Um, because all the work we do in health facilities, uh, strength, uh, trying to strengthen uh, the health clinics where people can go to get uh, medical support. You can't run a health facility without having clean water. Imagine a, a woman having to go through delivery and there's no running water or anything. Um, that, that is just not possible. So in such a program, uh, making sure wash is in place in that health facility is key. But also if you consider um, schools, um, also like a, a public place, um, girls will fall out of school for many reasons. Um, but one of the reasons is when they have their period and there's no uh, sanitation or there's no water, they can't um, take care of themselves. It's a very clear reason why girls drop out at least every month when that happens. So for us also when we work with uh, the youth population and, 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 and with schools, this is just part of it. But another uh, very important aspect is also AMREF is working in the communities. We are actually a grassroots organization. That's how we started many years ago. Um, we have the trust of communities, but there are so many sensitive topics that you cannot just talk about. Not me, certainly, but also not our colleagues who are from, from the communities themselves. That's, for example, on uh, teenage pregnancies, child marriage, or female genital mutilation. Very sensitive topics, very cultural. Here uh, in the Netherlands, we can't even discuss Schwarte Piet. Uh, <laughs> maybe we can now, but... Uh, so if you want to enter a community and do something about the general health status, uh, but actually specifically work on FGM, uh, female genital mutilation, because there's a high prevalence, we start with talking about a very safe subject, which is access to water, access to sanitation, the general health of the population. And um, that's how we get accepted. That's how we get in the community. And when trust is built, we can also address the more sensitive topics. So also in that instance, um, it's just integrated in everything we do. There will never be, um, people won't be healthy if they don't have access to clean water. So yeah, it's a given. Yeah, thank you very much. So it's a given, it's very, very clear. Uh, will still it's not very clear towards uh, a lot of businesses and that's <laughs> in your daily life the thing that you do you advise uh, businesses about the importance uh, of water uh, can you tell us a bit about that how you influence them to uh, to see water 
as a as a vital source uh, for their uh, products and and even put it on their balance yeah great question uh, and I, I smile because uh, you know we like to think that we're making great progress but uh, I'm terribly impatient so I don't believe we're, we're making progress fast enough uh, I'll, I'll start by saying that the private sector has an incredibly important role in uh, solving water related uh, problems and challenges not to say that the private sector should replace the public sector and it goes back to the uh, image that you projected previously. So what is the role of the private sector? What do they deliver that uh, is unique to them that uh, they can deliver by working with the public sector, you know, investors, NGOs, and entrepreneurs? So having said that, uh, really the way I frame it is, is certainly, you know, you, you can't do anything without water. If you don't have water, uh, it's a business risk, and it's not just you having access to water. If the communities in which you operate in don't have access to wash, you have a problem. If your workforce does not have access to wash, you have a problem. If your supply chain doesn't, you definitely have a problem. So framing it uh, as a very broad business risk is really setting the stage I have found over the years that uh, I get the most traction when I talk about the business opportunities associated with water and the value of water to driving some core business uh, issues such as brand value. I think one of the other things that we've seen in the pandemic is uh, uh, you know, us really paying attention to brands with purpose. So who stepped up over the past several months and really started to engage in solving water-related issues? Uh, and there's an opportunity for companies, whether they're, you know, in quotes, water intensive or whether they're a telecom company to participate in solving water problems. So there's the brand value piece. There is the uh, attraction, retention of talent workforce cares about these issues now and, and also uh, as a driver for innovation uh, I, I think that is uh, a compelling business case for many companies and an example would be look at the information communication technology sector they have the ability to deliver digital water solutions that drive their business growth and they are now part of the solution and not part of the problem. I mean, you know, they have water use issues and, you know, water footprint and so on, but that's not the whole story. The whole story really brings in how they can leverage their technology and scale and thinking and innovation to solve water. Uh, you know, then I would also say, you know, it goes back to something I commented earlier on, you know, new companies coming in to look at water as a business opportunity and, and how do they uh, scale solutions. Yeah, and, and this scaling of solutions, this valuation, Bianca, you said at the start of the show, uh, we should not, you know, try to capture it all and to a value of money, yeah? per perceiving it as a risk that is worth something or an opportunity that is worth uh, something. But still, uh, quite a lot is uh, happening in, in looking at uh, water issues from a business-like view, right? And I think one interesting question popped up, uh, Jeroen uh, sent in, would tradable water rights work, maybe between countries uh, to uh, address access and distribution of water? Good question, good thought. It's interesting, huh? Yes, we have with climate change, you obviously have the carbon uh, trading, uh, the carbon credits. Yeah, something Ooh. similar for drought, for example. Or yeah, that, that would, yeah. Would be Ooh. interesting. Would be, definitely be interesting. I'm just, my mind is going on and I'm thinking like it's usually water is a very local problem, whereas carbon obviously is a global problem and carbon travels freely and water is very much linked to a location. Um, I, I don't 
I'm not quite sure whether that would work. I think in the value perspective, I, and, and I heard Will saying that as well, um, I think there's very much value, value in, in approaching water from a value perspective. And I stated indeed before, it, it's, it's we, the world, it's money makes the world turn around. Um, but it's not necessarily that you always have to monetize it, as, as Will already suggested. Um, for businesses, it's, it's looking at it from a business risk perspective. So it's in the end, it's impacting your, your balance sheet. You mentioned the wood balance sheet before as well. There are companies in this world who are actually putting water as an asset on their balance sheet. So then you're treating it in that sense in, in, in the right way. It's not a free commodity which is limitless within within uh, on the globe it's within the limits so if you approach it from that way i think uh, a lot can happen and especially then looking at the, the knowledge and expertise which we have available within the water sector there's a huge amount of organizations who have very innovative solutions um, i think there's so many solutions maybe we even can solve all the issues we have on the globe only we don't we are not matching them with 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 the the problems we have um, so the water sector, I found it to be very innovative, and even in these times um, where, where digital is raising, as Will stated, indeed, there's organizations really like a whole 24K. They are actually rebuilding a water purification system digitally and then tweaking it and testing it and making it more efficient, and then actually you go back to real life and re rebuild it and restructure it. So in that sense, the, um, the solutions we see for, for WASH, I find it amazing that there's a one of companies making water out of air. There's uh, another organization with a group of youngsters started that elemental water makers who actually make drinking water out of seawater uh, without using, well, with only using um, renewable energies. I think just bright minds thinking of those kind of solutions. Um, and then also thinking about the the, the way you might negatively impact the globe through carbon emissions. Well, there's no carbon emissions when the elemental water bike is using renewable energy. So just thinking more um, kind of holistic solutions. And in that sense, also thinking about the integrated solutions. So one last example I'm going to share at you, which is um, uh, how we, uh, and, and in New York, uh, a number of, uh, of Dutch companies actually supported the city of New York in, in, in safeguarding them against future floods. But it's not simply that we that they build a dike or whatever. What was done is actually collaborating with the communities in the city of New York on a social on asking them the question: How can we socially upgrade actually this 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 um, this part of the city as well, whilst at the same time also providing the solutions for for preventing the city from being flooded again? So finding those integrated solutions, collaborating um, with uh, with municipalities, with the businesses, with really the people on the ground, the NGOs. I think, um, and then taking into account the the value of water. Definitely not only from a monetary point of view, but really strategic. And what's it worth to me? What's water worth to me? Thinking in it that way, I think that's why we have to have to. Yeah, Patricia, what would be your piece of advice when it comes to making sure that these solutions, of which many are already there, are allocated, uh, that they get to the right uh, place? How, how do you work uh, uh, together with the other uh, stakeholders uh, from uh, AMREF? Yeah. No, I was uh, very interestingly actually listening, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, actually there is so much more already in place that you just don't know of. So one thing is actually how to get all these innovations really to the right place. Um, and um, I think um, if, if you are an NGO or a company that still thinks you can do it alone, uh, I think you can uh, just dissolve your whole organization because that's not going to happen. Um, so I think... Um, for NGOs like AMREF, um, it has been key years ago already to start thinking about, you know, what role do we play in this little ecosystem and where are, are these innovative players or the inv uh, impact investors or, uh, you know, how do we all play that little role? Um, and then share those best practices because that's also not happening, I think. Um, there should be a, a benefit for everybody that takes place or has a role in that ecosystem. Um, not just publishing, eh? because there's a lot of, no, uh, no, 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 no. you know, on the internet there's so many ideas and bright examples. Yeah. But really trying to help out by reaching out and saying, hey, I see you struggle with this, or maybe yeah. you have an idea that could also, be helpful. Yeah, what I also really like is uh, driving change from 
the community level. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not us here that need to think about all the solutions because those bright minds, they're also everywhere in Africa yeah. or in Asia or in Latin America. So to... Um, um, Just to, facilitate. Yeah. And make I mean, sure it, it, it is made possible, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that, okay, that making possible uh, sometimes requires a big company Mm -hmm. Because they can have a good innovation, even uh, to prevent malaria, whatever. Have a, have a good soap. There's a soap. You know, if you if you use that soap, uh, the, the, the mosquito won't sting you. Yeah, yeah. But how is uh, uh, this innovator who is living somewhere in a, in a village? How is how is that person getting access to financing or to uh, support? You know, to the right people to actually scale. Yeah, and it helps, of course, if the general public is very well aware of all that is happening uh, when it comes to a safe uh, water, so the access to yeah. clean drinking water, but also uh, sanitation, but also the issue with drought that we're uh, facing and all the consequences. So my question uh, to you, the next poll, is please answer, do you feel that the general public is well aware or should the water sector reach out even more to make these stories heartfelt uh, through the media and, and make everyone uh, know what is happening, what is going on, what they're facing. Because, you know, Bianca, previously you, you addressed the, the big crisis last year in uh, Cape Town and uh, it, uh, you know, it started to rain exactly uh, at the right moment. But if it had gone wrong, you know, that would have been a huge, huge uh, okay. problem right there. Yeah, yeah, but but still, it is on top of mind for a lot of people because it really yeah. made an impression. Uh, it was very impressive. So, I think uh, yeah, and and then we should also tell the story actually about the great solution which they are thinking of now, especially specifically in South Africa. And again, there's a Dutch companies involved, like like Arcadis, for example, and they're thinking about how can we reuse the storm water. So just thinking of those smart solutions, how you have water at a certain point of time, how can you in some way um, store it and then reuse it again? So thinking much more of when we have water available, then smart, very, in a very smart way, integrated in the society, integrated in the city, store it and then enable you to, to reuse it. So maybe that's the story we should telling now as well. Cape Town, yes, we had severe droughts, but we have smart people, smart minds, thinking of integrated solutions. Yeah, so we're talking about uh, uh, the, uh, the, the reaching out, sharing uh, stories, collaborating, uh, and I think digitalization, which is really boosted in this uh, time, uh, everyone is uh, uh, getting together uh, online, but also uh, we're using a lot of uh, data to make the right uh, decisions, to gain the right insights. So uh, let's uh, uh, talk about our final uh, topic, the opportunities that are out there in uh, digitalization. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to say that there's a lot of great stuff happening in the chat, uh, because uh, I read uh, 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 about an issue, uh, Cherno, uh, who is with a drinking wa water company in Mali, he said, well, a lot of people believe that water is a given from God, and how can you charge money for that? And then Gerdien said, well, you don't charge the money for the water, but for the cleaning of it and the transportation of it. And th that is really great, and that's all being answered. That's all happening huh? uh, in the chat. Um, so far, especially, you've been uh, sending in uh, questions. Uh, for now, also feel free to send in your uh, suggestions when it comes uh, to putting uh, water at the center of uh, the plans for uh, economic uh, recovery. What is happening uh, around you that other participants might uh, benefit uh, from? Or what is your uh, general uh, idea? How can we uh, reach out uh, and uh, stress the urgency uh, much more so that it gets into the heart of all the uh, plans out there? So opportunities in digitalization is a final uh, topic, uh, but let's start with a short video vlog by another uh, young expert from the YEP uh, program, Cherno Amadou Sissoko of the Drinkwater Facility Soma JEP in Mali. Hello, my name is Cherno Amadou Sissoko. I'm financial and accountant manager by profession. I work as statistic officer at Soma JEP, which is uh, the Malian public drinking water company. I'm also the assistant of the Waterworks local project leader. Speaking of digital innovation solving global water challenges, 
we can talk about local irrigation and the drinking water sector in Mali, which are important factors for development. The use of new technologies such as geographic information system and remote sensing device paves the way for the better technique for planning and controlling irrigation and water quality. Introduction of the drone tool is a good example of a new technology being tested to improve monitoring, evaluation and communication. Remote communities are less and less isolated and it will be increasingly easy to, for them to integrate new technology into their agricultural and hydraulic activities in order to increase their productivity, better meet their need and profit economically from the fruit of their work. Thank you very much, uh, Cherno, for uh, sharing with us what is happening in Mali in the field of uh, digitalization when it comes to uh, water and it's also our final uh, uh, topic. Uh, uh, Joseph, uh, can you uh, share with us what you see uh, happen uh, around you when it comes to digitalization there in Kenya? Yeah, thanks a lot, thanks a lot Rick again. The, the, um, basically the, the, um, the adoption of technology, managed water is, is a trend that has been, you know, that, that started happening around a, a couple of years ago. Um, I need probably, before I proceed, to say that water is probably one of the last adopters, it's a laggard in that sense, in, in terms of adoption of technology. Other sectors, be they energy, financial services, real estate, adopted technology, quite a lot earlier. And, and the reason water is um, a laggard in this respect is generally because of what we've been discussing. Uh, what I see as a social good, or as you said earlier on, a gift from God, and therefore uh, you need not be efficient in terms of uh, delivering it. Everybody, you know, will get it when they get it. And, and, so, and so because of that, the um, adoption of technology or digitalization, as it were, uh, began a bit late in the water sector, at least in Kenya. But increasingly, and also accelerated by COVID, it is, uh, it is taken root. Um, and we are seeing trends in, um, in basically about three or four areas. The first area we are seeing this is in um, what we call a metering infrastructure. So right at abstraction level, and at the first point of the water value chain, um, quite a lot of um, a, Smart meters are being put in place. Uh, Kifa is actually working on a project uh, like that to put advanced meters at um, all water abstraction points within the country as a way of providing accurate water abstraction data on a real time basis to the, to the, uh, to the water regulator. Um, the second trend we are seeing is in because of water is becoming uh, valuable. So we are seeing quite a lot of prepaid meters coming up, cutting up, and a lot of prepaid meter companies. I, I think at the last count, to about probably close to 10 within the Kenya water sector alone, because people want to know precisely how much water they use, and then pay, pay for it um, uh, as it were. And then we are seeing quite a lot of what we call adoption of the Internet of Things within, within the water space. Uh, basically just using um, internet uh, to provide water um, water consumption solutions to water companies um, for, for them the water companies to be able to know who's using how much water where uh, and, and what time and then uh, sort of um, uh, linking that to the building platforms which is then linked to the to, to, to the payment solutions, either through uh, mobile money or through directly through uh, through the bank. And then uh, finally, the other trend we are seeing is that most water companies are now um, uh, adopting digital payment solutions. I mean, nobody is using uh, uh, cash money anymore. Um, so a lot of water companies are partnering with the telecom companies to provide digital payment solutions to their customers and to use that also to do reconciliations in terms of uh, water consumption data and, and water availability data in, in various places. But 
would say literally the entire world of value chain is now adopting um, adopting technology, uh, whether uh, for just telling quantities of water abstract are, are being used or consumed, uh, whether be telling uh, what whether it's for for telling the water temperature, water quality, uh, water quality, or is whether it's for uh, it's for payments uh, for payments or bill settlement as it were. Thanks, uh, Joseph. So it's a lot of uh, technology, a lot of innovation. It makes the operation much more uh, efficient. It makes it uh, easier to do the job uh, to do the job uh, well. Patricia, you use uh, digitalization in a completely different way, also to educate uh, uh, people yeah. on remote locations uh, as well. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, uh, because actually, um, educating health workers. Uh, our goal is to do that across Africa, but if we have to educate in classrooms and go everywhere or get people to to uh, main cities, that's just not, yeah, you're not going to reach your objectives. Actually, millions of health workers need to be trained. Um, so years ago, we developed an app mm -hmm. uh, together with a telecom company and, um, and the local government, and we had some support from uh, Accenture. Um, so that was a that was a whole co-creation, and we launched an app. And at this moment, we have like 36 health modules uh, on this app, which runs on a very basic uh, phone, not a smartphone, but just like the old Nokia that we used to have a long time ago. Um, and all these health modules, uh, you can do them by listening uh, to podcasts, uh, by going through text. Um, messages basically and, and teaching or uh, checking with yourself whether you have gained really all the knowledge that you need for that specific module which could be about high blood pressure or HIV um, and it's it shows to be very effective actually to be learning that way so just with your phone in your own time wherever you are whenever you want to do it and it's for free because the people just call to a toll-free number and get access to that whole module. It's continuous learning. Uh, they also have a chat function so they can reach other healthcare uh, workers and, and check uh, whether a diagnosis they see is the correct one or what they should do. Uh, and if necessary, we can also send push messages uh, to lots of health workers. And this has happened for COVID, um, where the, the government in Kenya actually called Amref Kenya and said, okay, we really need to, to go into the communities right now with messages on COVID. You have this platform, this app, and there were at that moment, I think 26,000 health workers registered on the platform. So within like a few days, everybody was informed through the platform. And we developed a new module, especially on COVID, together with the Ministry of Health. Um, so yeah, that's actually how we are using digital um, the, the mobile phone that almost everybody has um, and that one ha is scaling now to lots of other countries. So the, the benefit actually of this crisis is that there, there's more funding for AMREF to take this to other countries. So Ethiopia and Uganda and Malawi and Tanzania. And okay. also I can imagine that this is a really cheap uh, yeah. measure like uh, you, you design the program and you put some great effort to it to make sure that it's perfect information and it is compelling, engaging, yeah. but then you push it to these 20,000 uh, people and th that, that is really amazing. And I can I Im imagine that it enthuses everyone who is working at uh, AMREF and also uh, the businesses and the private uh, donors, right? Oh, absolutely. And I think we actually... At this moment, we have 63,000 health workers on the platform, so it's wow. it's really rising rapidly. There's a huge uptake, and uh, yeah, so I think this is a wonderful development. Yeah, and and it's it's something that did not happen 10 years ago, eh? so it, it, it's it's really speeding up. You needed to take yeah. a lot more effort uh, in those uh, days. Uh, so, Will, can you? Uh, a sketch uh, the, the the full picture when when it comes to the water value chain. How does uh, digitalization have an impact already, and what's happening uh, towards the near future? Sure. So uh, before I dive into that figure, I, I just want to comment on how we communicate about water because we've been touching on that issue in terms of how do you communicate the value of water, how do you engage other stakeholders in. 
I, I really believe we need to stop calling this the drought or a drought. Uh, you know, my view, and I'm quite sure it's shared by others, is that water is over allocated, poorly governed, and the past is not a guide to the future. So when we talk about the drought, people hope for rain. And when we talk about day zero, uh, you know, it's we, we need to abandon looking at the past in order to think about how to manage water as a critical resource going forward. So thanks for indulging me for about a minute on that comment. Uh, but getting to digital, I, I agree with my colleagues here that uh, the way to view this is a digital value chain. And if you think about how digital has transformed every other aspect of our lives, uh, it is in the process of happening in the water sector right now. And the way you know I look at this and, and others is, you know, think about what's happening in the watershed across the supply chain in terms of digital technology. So this is everything from satellite data acquisition and analytics coupled with drones, coupled with on the ground sensors. Uh, Joseph talked about IoT, incredibly powerful in terms of collecting data uh, and turning it into actionable information. And then in the middle of the value chain, you have obviously the, the water utilities, water and wastewater utilities, but also industrial clients that are you know manufacturing things. Uh, and uh, there's all sorts of innovation going on right now uh, in terms of using artificial intelligence technologies to manage water use, uh, energy use, reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions, manage assets better in terms of uh, leak detection, uh, augmented virtual reality tools to enable the workforce to do more uh, and to do uh, their work remotely. Uh, and then, you know, Patricia and, and Joseph also talked about connecting to the customer, consumer, and other stakeholders. You know, our handheld devices are now computers, so I can pay my bills, I can get data on uh, water quantity and quality, and I can turn it into actionable information. So the digital value chain is very broad and very powerful, and digital transformation has finally arrived to our relationship with water. And that's an incredibly powerful trend. And I believe we have a better shot at achieving SDG 6 because of digital. Yeah, it's really speeding up uh, everything along its way. And also digitalization has really sped up uh, during COVID-19. Here's my final poll for you. I'd like your opinion on this one. Digitalization will make it easier to attract investors for water hygiene and sanitation. Also nicely bridging a question sent in by Jeroen, who asks, would digital solutions contribute to improving access to water? And also some criticism from Gerdien, who is wondering if needed money is not wasted on all these uh, fancy gadgets, you know, all these uh, innovations. Is it really contributing? But that's not what the position is about. This uh, position is about digitalization will make it easier to attract investors for water hygiene and sanitation so improving access to wash 25 percent of you strongly agrees 50 percent agrees and now uh, those results have changed just a little bit uh, bianca the final remarks are yours uh, for this uh, show what do you expect to see in the near future how do we take it from here as a water sector? Well, it's a very big question. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, what to say about it? I, I found it actually extremely interesting what we are talking about and the different subjects we were, were addressing. And it, it, it shows actually the complexity of what of water in on this globe. Um, it shows that we can't solve it. But once the one sector, the water sector alone actually can't solve it. It also shows that only industry or only governments can can solve it. This is where we need sheer collaboration. That's the most important thing. Um, and I, I see that happening more and more. And actually, I think COVID now with us working from home, easy access to different webinars, conferences, where a lot of people, more people can join in actually and participate. So I, I see different um, 
types of organizations coming together more. I also see different sectors working together a lot more. Um, so it's, yes, digitization within the water sector, I think that's a key component of solving a lot of the global issues we face right now. But also the cross-sectoral collaboration, which you see the water sector do more and more, and where you see other sectors asking for solutions from, from the water sector. That integration also, again, facilitated, I believe, by easy access to different kind of webinars nowadays, different kind of conferences will, 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 will trigger that. So I'm positive by nature. So um, I think we, we, have every, we have all the tools to actually solve, solve this global issue. Um, it is uh, really we need to start talking to one another and well, actually with one another and finding those solutions. And yes, sometimes challenging the other, or other parties. Like I challenged in the beginning maybe the governance, governments a, a little bit with their all the recovery um, funds which are set up right now, maybe challenging the finance sector in that sense as well. Put water central there because it touches up on everything uh, you need. We have uh, a water crisis going on, definitely. We have a food issue globally. We have a climate issue globally. Again, all those, uh, we have refugees. We, we have, we have, all those issues are somehow linked to water. So I believe in, in collaboration. I believe in innovation. And yes, digitization and cross-sectoral work will uh, definitely play a big role in that. And let's have more of these gatherings where we bring those solutions together, because that's what I picked up as well. Storytelling, sharing, and connecting, enabling one another access to the wonderful solutions which we globally have. Great thoughts to end uh, this uh, first edition, but not the last of NWP Meetup. A big uh, thank you to our experts, uh, Will Sarni, Joseph Muraboula, Patricia Vermeulen, and Bianca Nijhoff. And a big thank you for your active uh, participation. Have a great day, and let's stay connected.